Well, Jason Lusk is no stranger to controversy. Lusk is the author of The Food Police, a well-fed manifesto about the politics of your plate, a book where he takes shots at many of the conventional wisdoms currently held about nutrition and agriculture. And his latest targets are GMOs and those who oppose them in our food supply. Earlier, I sat down with the Oklahoma State University agricultural economics professor here in our studio. So what has changed in the past decade that you think now it's time we readdress this issue? Well, I think there are several things. One is there's a lot of really interesting and exciting research going on, both by food and agribusiness companies, but also by nonprofit groups and by universities all across the U.S. So there are a lot of really interesting traits that are being developed that have a lot of promise. Uh, in terms of, of biotechnology. Bio, biotechnology, by the way, is not the solution for all the problems. Uh, you know, it's important not to overhype it, but I think it does um, have the potential to, um, um, to provide some advantages to producers and to consumers. So I think that's one thing. There's been more technological research uh, that's come about. Another thing is, you know, we've been growing this stuff since the mid-90s now um, for, in corn and soybeans. So it's, it's been a long period of time, and there's a, a lot better understanding of the consequences both at the farm level and at the consumer level, we, we have known for a long time due to all kinds of research, whether it's animal feeding trials or whatnot, that there really isn't any evidence of adverse health consequences from biotechnology. But I think 20 years of eating experience has also uh, partially changed that. And again, we see very widespread acceptance of these technologies in, in, among other farm commodities. So I think it's a combination of those things. And also when you look at wheat in particular, there have been changes that I think um, have made people perhaps a little more open to the idea. And, and one of those things is we've had a recent drought so thinking about varieties that are more hardy, more tolerant to um, to drought and, and, and low water conditions, I think is something that, that has gotten people thinking. And moreover, if you look at the amount of acreage that's planted to wheat in the United States, it's really declined uh, quite dramatically over the last 20 to 30 years. And there's a big combination of factors for why that's true, but I think it's also caused people to think a little bit about what is it that has made other commodities like corn and soybeans, and, and especially in Oklahoma, canola, relatively more attractive, and what is it about wheat that can maybe uh, keep it in, in terms of making it relatively competitive and in many ways you know so goes the US so goes the world and while you talk about the hardiness traits and, and and the drought tolerance you know here we're really talking about profitability when we talk about those things but when you go into other parts of the world we're talking about food security about them even having a crop to feed themselves that's that's exactly right and, and I mentioned early on one of the fears with some of the, the genetically engineered varieties is how our how the how, how the, our importers are going to react the people buying this stuff but if you look at the major import of U.S. wheat, you know, some of the biggest ones are in countries like Egypt and Sub-Saharan Africa actually represents one of the biggest importers. Uh, and these countries are, are deeply concerned about food insecurity, and we've seen a lot of political unrest in those countries, and I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that some of that political unrest came about because of high food prices in 2008 and 2011. So these, these countries are deeply concerned about being able to secure a steady supply of food that's not too expensive, that people in those countries can eat. And so I, I think that it's important for these countries to be able to have access to technologies that make food less expensive, and I think those attitudes are also going to carry over to our trading partners. And, and by the way, if we uh, in the U.S. were to adopt a genetically engineered wheat variety, we probably wouldn't be the only one. It's not as if we're the only country producing wheat. Canada's probably working on it. I can bet there are people in other countries like Australia and elsewhere who are probably thinking about these same issues. And if U.S. producers want to remain competitive in a world market, one of the things they have to do is have some of the best knowledge available, but also access to some of the best technologies available. And ultimately, this could be good for our rural and actually our, our entire economies here in the Southern Plains. I think that's the idea. Again, if you look at corn and soybeans, the fact that 90% of acres are planted in biotech variety, you know, behind every one of those acres, there was a farmer making a decision. Which of these varieties do I plant? And, and sometimes, you know, you, you, you hear arguments that, you know, genetic engineering hasn't delivered on all these great promises. And, and maybe that's true in some cases it was overhyped, but at the end of the day, you got farmers making decisions. And at least in their eyes, you look at the decisions they've made, they're telling us when they're, when they're voting with their feet and with their dollars, that they think they're getting something out of that biotech variety, whether it's time savings, whether it's um, the ability to remove the downside risk of yields, or the ability to convert to no-till practices. I think that, that when you look at the choices farmers have actually made, we can see that they perceive that there are a lot of advantages. 
Well, certainly an interesting opinion piece in the New York Times and one that I think will has started some to debate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.